Hello everybody, my name is George, I work at ThoughtBot, and uh, today I'd like to talk about machine learning. Uh, there have been a lot of introductions to machine learning floating around online in the last few years, but they often fall into one of two categories. One category is just type these magic Python words and don't worry about what's happening, it's going to be fine. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to do that. The other category is, it's obvious, right? It's just, it's just grad school maths, come on. We're also not going to do that. We're going to try and, and chart the middle ground between those two and talk about what the high-level big ideas are in machine learning without getting into actual implementation, but hopefully we'll give you the landmarks that you need to go on to do implementation in the future, and you won't need any math to understand this. Um, so the first big question I'd like to address is, what can machine learning do for us? Like, why has this thing become so popular? What can it do that we can't do with other types of programming? So here's a concrete problem that I faced recently in some software I was writing. I needed to parse ingredients from recipes that were written for humans, not for computers. So I wanted to pull out three pieces of information about each ingredient in these recipes. The quantity of the ingredient, the unit that that quantity was measured in, and the name of the, the ingredient. So in this case, it's two tablespoons of butter. And the first couple of recipes I looked at, I thought, this is going to be easy. It's just three words. It's a number and then a, a unit and then a name. I can just split these up on spaces. It's going to be fine. And then I looked at more recipes and more recipes and more recipes. And I moved from white space splitting to regular expressions and from regular expressions to parsing libraries and from parsing libraries to tokenizing libraries. And I eventually realized I just can't do this with conventional programming. And that's when I reached for machine learning. The killer feature of machine learning, the thing that I needed here, is a property called generalization. Generalization is the idea that we can build a system which is able to deal with inputs that we didn't explicitly consider when we were designing the system. Right, so there are so many different ways of, exp of, of explaining how much of an ingredient you need in, in a recipe in the English language. I was never going to consider every single one of those possibilities. But maybe if I got a bunch of examples together and built a system that could generalize from those examples to other things that it hadn't seen, maybe I'd still do OK. That sounds really hard. Uh, think about how you do programming, right? It's, it's typically writing a list of very, very explicit instructions for a computer to follow. And we want this property of generalization. Those two things don't really seem to line up. Like, we have computers which can only follow very, very specific step-by-step -step instructions. And, you know, we have all these nice abstractions where we group all these inst instructions into functions and objects. And it, it kind of seems like we're dealing with higher level ideas, but really it's just a linear flow of do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. How do we get that kind of literal step-by-step -step machine to generalize for us? And when I was first learning about machine learning, I realized that I'd done this before. I hadn't done it as a software developer. I hadn't done it in any of the programs I'd written. It wasn't covered in my computer science degree, but I had done it before. Who remembers their high school science class? A few of you? Okay. When your teacher said, this is going to be really useful later in life, pay attention, it turns out they weren't lying. Um, <laughs> It actually can come in useful. So we're going to go through a high school science experiment right now, and then we're going to see how that is very, very similar to the process of building a machine learning system. Uh, to help us go through this high school science experiment, I brought a piece of very advanced, highly calibrated scientific equipment with me. Um, I don't want to baffle you too much with technical definitions, but this is what physicists call a tennis ball. <laughs> when we drop this tennis ball, it's going to bounce. And I think that there's probably a relationship between the height of the drop and the height of the bounce. So if I drop it from high up, it bounces quite high. If I drop it from low down, it's quite a small bounce. But we'd like to discover by doing this experiment what that relationship is between the drop height and the bounce height. So step one in our experiment is to collect a bunch of data. We want to make empirical observations. We want to look at the world and see what happens in practice, in reality. And that just involves dropping a tennis ball a bunch of times. We've got to measure the height we drop it from. We've got to measure the height it bounces to. 
I hope you're all making notes when I do this of how high it's bouncing so we can use those <laughs> results. Um, being good scientists, we want to try and limit the variables we're changing. So we're going to use the same tennis ball. We're going to drop it on the same floor. We're going to do it in the same temperature, all those kind of things. And when we have that data set, we can put it on a scatter chart that, that looks something like this. So when I drop the tennis ball from one meter, it bounces to about three quarters, it looks like. From two, it looks like about one and a half. When it's dropped from three, it bounces to about two. So you can see drop height along the bottom, bounce height up the side. The next thing we do in high school in our science experiment is build a mathematical model. Well, there you might be thinking, no one ever said the words build a mathematical model to me in high school. They didn't to me either, but that's what we were doing. We draw a line on the chart. You can see that all the points on this chart are arranged in roughly a straight line. And what we, what we were taught to do at high school was draw a line on the chart that kind of lines up with the points that we'd observed. Looking at this chart, we can see the straight line. We can see that the points lie in roughly a straight line. So what's the reason for like making it explicit and drawing a line on the chart? Well, it's a mathematical model. We've actually just built a generalizing system right now by drawing this line on the chart. You see, we took a measurement at one meter, and we took a measurement at two meters, but we didn't take any measurements in between. But by drawing this line that expresses the trend that exists in our data, we've built a generalizing system that can predict drop heights that we never took a measurement for. So that's pretty cool. We can even write software that can predict bounce heights now. So what is a straight line? It's made up of two different values, really, which I've called gradient and intercept here. Um, the, the intercept is where it crosses the vertical axis. So this bounce height axis and this drop height axis, they meet here at 0, 0. And the intercept is, OK, when the drop height is 0, what is the bounce height at that point? I think it's going to be 0, but we can prove that using science. Yep, it's 0. Um, the gradient is every time the drop height increases by 1, how much does the bounce height increase by? And with those two values, we can, we can write this little bit of Python code to predict the bounce heights of balls. So we've, we've built by hand a generalizing system. We've built by hand something which, from a few examples, can predict lots more examples. But there's a couple of questions we should ask about a generalizing system. The first one is, how well does it fit the observations that we've already made? Like, I just moved this line around. You know, I just did it by eye, and I was like, well, it's about here. But is this better, or is that better? It's, it's sort of hard to tell. So does our model fit with our observations? Well, we can measure that, too. I've added some red lines to the chart here, which are the distance between the observations we took and the model that we've built to make new predictions. Um, and you can see this error number down at the bottom of the slide. What I've done to calculate that error number is I've measured the height of those red lines, I've squared them all to make sure they're positive numbers, and then I've taken the average. So when the line is here, we can, we can tell just by looking that it's very far away, but the error number confirms that by being very large. As we move the line closer and closer and closer to the observations we've made, the error number drops. And eventually, it gets to pretty close to zero until we go too far and it starts getting bigger again as we go out the other side. So it looks like somewhere around there is probably the best that we're going to get. This is how machine learning algorithms are trained often. There is a model that we've chosen, in this case a straight line, and that model is controlled by where it crosses the axis and how steep the line is. And we have a set of observations that we've made, and we can see how far away the line is from the, from the observations. When people talk about training a machine learning algorithm, 
or training a machine learning model, I should say. What the machine learning algorithm is doing is it's trying lots of different models to see which one fits best with the data. So you can imagine writing some code that started with this line and went, oh, is that, is that good? Well, no, the error is quite high. OK, let's move a small step. How about now? Well, the error has gone down, so we're going in the right direction. That's good. Let's move a small step. The error has gone down again. Let's move a small step. Training a machine learning model is about running an iterative algorithm which finds the best set of parameters that fit the model to the data. Everyone with me so far? Great. So now we've, we've made a model and we've, we've kind of got some sense of how well that model fits to the observations that we've already made. The next question we should ask ourselves is, does the model generalize? The whole point of making this model in the first place was we wanted something that had this seemingly magical property of generalization. So did we, did we get it? Um, and what we can do there is oops, go back to our tennis ball. And we can take new measurements, measurements that we didn't use when we were first making our model. And we can say, OK, well, the model said that if we measured at one meter, we measured at about two meters. The model said if we drop from one and a half meters, we expect a bounce of about one meter. It's probably about there. Seems about right. I think we did OK. I think our model can generalize. In a machine learning scenario, we'd often collect all of this data up front. And then we'd split off a section of the data to use to test the generalization capabilities of the model after the fact. So machine learning. Did I really just describe machine learning? Is it really that simple? Well, we need to collect examples. When I was building my recipe parsing system, I needed to collect examples of ingredient descriptions. I didn't do this by dropping a tennis ball. I did it by building web scrapers and pulling data in from websites and pushing that data into a Postgres database. Then we need to train a model. It's not always clear what the model should be. With the example of the tennis ball, we could look at the data on the chart and see that everything was lining up neatly into a straight line. Um, that, that was nice. It was nice to be able to just eyeball it and go, oh, it's a straight line. That's great. Normally, the situations we want to use machine learning for are much more complicated than just a single input and a single output. Even with the example of our tennis ball, say we wanted to try to model more sizes of balls. So we wanted to be able to drop not just a tennis ball, but also a squash ball, maybe a soccer ball, maybe a basketball. They're made of different materials. They have different sizes, different densities. We want to drop them on. To, onto different surfaces, all of those are going to have different bounce characteristics. So instead of having a nice two-dimensional chart we could look at that was just drop height, bounce height, we'd end up with many, many, many dimensions. That's difficult to look at and just go, oh, it should be that model. So in a real machine learning situation, we'll often have to try several different models. The process we've gone through here is a real machine learning process that people use. It's, it's known as linear regression. And it's good at things that lie in straight lines. But there are many other processes. There are many other models. You may have heard of neural networks, for example. They're capable of modeling lines that have all kinds of curves and wiggles in them. If it's a numerical thing, they're also capable of making decisions between different things. Is this photo a hot dog? Is it not a hot dog? <laughs> One of the most important questions in machine learning today. So training a model sadly isn't always as simple as the example we've just, we've just given, because knowing which model to use isn't always clear. But as we've seen, we can test our models to understand how well they fit the data, to understand how well they generalize. So we might have to try a whole range of models. We might have to say, well, maybe it fits with a linear model. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe we need a more complex model than that. We could try a neural network. We could try many different types of neural networks which one's going to work the best. But we have ways of testing the model by seeing how well it fits with different sets of data to know, did we do a good job? Did we pick the right one? And then the thing that we never did in high school science class, because we never needed to, but that we can do with our machine learning models, is go out into the real world and make predictions. So um, you know, I, 
I don't often need to predict the height of bouncing a tennis ball, but if I did, I now have a model I could use to do that. Uh, if you were going to build a machine learning model to, say, figure out if someone buys this product on my website, what other product are they likely to buy, that might drive some traffic and, uh, and sell more stuff for your company. So as I promised, this has not been enough to go out and build a machine learning model, but it's hopefully given you kind of the high-level landmarks that you can use to navigate the machine learning space. So what should you do next? Like if this has sparked your interest and, and hopefully it's got you thinking, oh, maybe this machine learning thing is, is possible and not just a whole bunch of graduate level math, um, what should you do from here after this talk? Well, one thing I really like is uh, fast.ai. Uh, they have an online course which is aimed at developers, and they have a philosophy very similar to the philosophy of this talk, which is that it needn't seem like just magical incantations, and also it needn't uh, involve graduate level math. Um, another thing that I've really enjoyed is this book, uh, Fundamentals of Machine Learning for Predictive Data Analytics. This is a, a book that has a whole collection of machine learning algorithms grouped by the type of algorithm that they are. So the, the example we just ran through is what's called error-based learning, because we looked at how far the line was from the data. That was a measure of the error, and we tried to reduce the error. There are other kinds of learning where we say, well, instead of how bad is it and can we make it better, we say, OK, each step we take through this algorithm, how much information are we gaining? Or how similar is this thing to another thing? The general process is the same, but, but this book gives a good overview of those different families of, of algorithms and how they might work. I think these, these two resources, um, the, the online course and the book, kind of take you in different directions. The online course is more how to do this practically in the real world if you want to build systems. This is more dive into understanding and how these algorithms work. There's a bit more math in this book than there is in the talk, but one of the things I like about this book is that the math is always followed with a clear English explanation of what it's doing and a worked example with real numbers so it's not just a soup of Greek, Greek symbols. And that's it. That's your high level introduction to machine learning. Um, any questions, you're welcome to ask them now. I'm at George Brock almost everywhere, including the Slack organization for this conference, where you can drop me an email. That URL will totally work as soon as I type git push. Um, <laughs> Oh, and as I mentioned, I work, I work at Thorbot. We're a consultancy. Uh, if you want to talk to me about that, then please do. I have cool robot stickers. Oh, thank you. Any questions? How well does your recipe parser work? And how complicated did it become? How much work did you have to put into it? Um, so the question was, how, how well did the recipe parser work, and how complicated did it become? How much work did I need to put into it? Um, so what I ended up doing was labeling by hand 2,000 uh, ingredient descriptions, um, saying, OK, this part is the, is the number, this part is the unit, this part is the name, and then also labeling words that I didn't care about as just being other. And then I ran that through an off-the-shelf machine learning model from uh, Stanford's Natural Language Processing Group. Um, so the code was quite simple, because all the complicated stuff was in the library I borrowed from Stanford. Um, but the process of preparing the training set was quite time consuming. Um, this machine learning thing ain't as glamorous as it appears sometimes. I just spend lots and lots of time in Vim going, quantity, quantity. Quantity, not a quantity. It was, it, it was a wild weekend. Um, it worked reasonably well. Uh, I, I've written a fairly long blog post about this, which has um, like various error metrics and scores and things in it, uh, which I can't remember off the top of my head. But I'd be happy to send you a link. And I, I'll add a link to the slides. Any other questions? Is no. some of that like manual process kind of grunt labor, is that still a part of machine learning? Like, is that still kind of just like a nature of the beast? Yeah, so the, the question was, is the manual process kind of grunt work uh, still a part of machine learning? Is that the nature of the beast? It depends a little bit on what you're doing. Um, most of the machine learning stuff I've done is what's called supervised learning, where you need both the input and the expected output. 
you're kind of like with our um, you know drop height bounce height example. You need both numbers to train the to train the model, um, and in that case, it it depends what the data set is. Sometimes there are existing data sets you can use that just kind of have the answers baked into them, but often there aren't. Uh, another thing I've worked on is an OCR system for badly scanned typewritten documents from the 1970s. And again, that involved a whole bunch of manual processing to say, this character's an A, this character's a B. It's, um, yeah, I think it often is the nature of the beast. But then if you think about things like game playing systems, so like AlphaGo is a big thing that's been in the news. Um, the version of, of AlphaGo, which beat a top level player at Go last year was trained on uh, on professional games of Go that already existed. So they just had to take that data set from the world and apply it. They didn't have to actually go and play the games themselves. They could just you know, take, take the existing data set. So it depends on what you're doing. It depends if the data already exists. But you may have to go out and make it. The, there always seems to be a bunch of complexity with the data somewhere. Maybe you don't have to make the data set, but maybe it's a mess, or it's coming from 20 different sources, and you have to try and reconcile them first. Um, Often, especially with complex models, having lots of data is a benefit. And any time you need lots of data, there's going to be lots of, of just overhead to the process of getting it and cleaning it and putting it in the same place. Uh, any other questions? Yep. So uh, you've been giving a great introduction for total beginners to machine learning. This is how I summarize this stuff. This is great. Now tell us a little bit more about Python, please. And your big question. Okay. Um, so the question was, uh, you've given us a great introduction to machine learning. Thank you, by the way. But uh, can you tell us a bit more about Python? Well, um, Python is a dynamic language, language that was developed by Guido Van Rooy. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. Uh, a lot of, um, a lot of the math behind machine learning algorithms um, ends up being uh, linear algebra, which is a thing that NumPy and SciPy do well. And because NumPy and SciPy and that kind of family of tools do that type of math well, there is a whole bunch of stuff built around that in the Python ecosystem. Um, so lots of tools and libraries exist for Python. Uh, the course that I mentioned, um, they use some Python tools in here. So yeah, Py the reason I figured this talk would work at a Python conference was because Python is the right language to know if you want to start getting deeper into this stuff. You're going to find better libraries in Python than you are elsewhere in the world. But it's also a really moving target, because this stuff is a rapidly growing field. So. You know, you could learn a tool today, but that's probably not the tool you're going to be learning in a year. But it's probably still going to be a Python tool you're using in a year, so, you know. Yeah. Can you tell us a little more about other problems that you use machine learning on, or maybe the most interesting problem? Yeah, so the question was, uh, can you tell us more about other problems you've used machine learning on, or um, maybe the most interesting problem? Um, Honestly, I'm fairly new to this. The, the two real things I have built are the recipe thing and the OCR thing for old scanned documents. Um, I've built a bunch of like toy things and tutorial-based things as well. But um, yeah, the, I think the OCR thing has been more interesting because there are a wider range of models that can be applicable to that problem, um, including a lot of the, the kind of deep learning neural networks where you have many, you essentially end up with many, many small models, a lot like the one we just looked at, all kind of communicating with each other. So like the input might be, is this pixel black or white in the, in the picture of a character? And that goes through a small model that makes some decision, which feeds into a small model that makes some decision, which feeds into a small model that makes some decision. And several layers later, you don't completely know necessarily what these models are deciding about, but the thing that falls out the end is a, a classification of, oh yeah, this image was the letter A or the letter B. Um, so I think because of, the, because of the variety of models available for, for image recognition, that's been a, the, the more interesting problem because there's, there's the kind of, not just does the model fit the data and does the model generalize to new examples, but also the kind of cross-validation problem of is this model better than this model? Is that one better than that one? 
Um, yeah. One more question from the speaker again. Yeah. 